then Mel, if you could just stop sharing your screen, we can. Perfect. Okay. 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 No. <laughs> no, it's front and center, really. Uh, okay. Are we ready to start? Is the ASL here? A I do not see ASL. I do have some. Um, um, I see Anissa oh. on the attendees list. Yeah. Oh, okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Ah, got it. Okay, perfect. Okay. I've promoted. Awesome. Um, we're still waiting for David. He should be here. He said he's been waiting for the past 20 minutes. Oh, I see him here. I see him uh, in the attendees yeah. list. D. Colenda. Yeah. He has been promoted. I'm trying to do so. Um, I have to just actually just do. can see everyone. And um, can the speakers turn on their cameras? Yep. There they are. Hey. I'll just give you one side here. So you can't pin them? Um, so everyone's going to be seeing everything right now for like this until we start and then whoever oh, speaks okay. will be on. Okay, I think we're ready to start. Okay, great. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, welcome to the sixth annual speaker series of the Studio for Media Activism and Critical Thought. My name is Nawang, and I will be co-hosting today's event alongside SMAC Studio Manager Mel Racho. Uh, I'd like, also like to give a shout out to our tech support, Zane, uh, and Anissa and David for providing interpretation for services for us today. Thank you all. Today's event, uh, Make Madness Mad Again, Mental Health in the Age of Social Media is co-sponsored by SMACT and the Office of Social Innovation. Using moments from contemporary cultural production, for example, film, television, music, uh, and et cetera, this panel features uh, Dr. Idil Abdullahi, Dr. Christopher Smith, and Dr. Ricky Varghese. Um, we'll discuss the ways in which madness and mental health have become co-opted in the pr present moment to fit with neoliberal and capitalist ways of being in the world. We will also um, try to attempt um, strategies uh, for survival, uh, strategies to be mad. Uh, and just a bit about our co-sponsor today, um, the Office of Social Innovation at X University, OSI. Um, they strive to create transformative solutions to complex social issues through teaching, learning, research, and community engagement. They advance opportunities to support, drive, and lead change at the university and with the broader community. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, a little bit about us. Uh, SMACT at X University was founded by Dr. Marusia Busirkov in 2014. SMACT is a laboratory for some of Canada's most compelling media scholars, artists, and activists. Mobilizing knowledge across the city, we organize an exciting yearly roster of symposia, yearly speaker series, workshops, and student and faculty research creation outputs. And now I'd like to invite SMACT Director Marusia to say a few words. Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, uh, to our speakers. Um, uh, we're meeting in person tonight at X University. That's why I'm wearing a mask. 
And uh, you can see the, our students in one of the screens there. Um, maybe give a shout out everybody, say hello. Uh, so this class is Social Justice Media and um, it's part of the, the speaker series is part of the students curriculum and they're gonna be blogging about this event. Um, so I'm gonna do the land acknowledgement. Uh, <clears throat> X University is in Toronto, traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Huron-Wendat peoples. Toronto is a Mi'kmaq word, meaning the place where the trees are standing. The streets of Toronto are built upon original portage trails, part of an ancient indigenous water-powered industry. Those rivers were dramatically impacted by settlers. Deforestation, pollution, and disease meant they are mostly covered over now. So you can hear the underground rivers singing after rainfall. My mother and father were respectively economic migrants and refugees from Soviet occupied Ukraine. And they settled in Treaty 6 territory in Alberta on the shores of the North Saskatchewan River. The prairies were also the site of a historic friendship between Ukrainian settlers and the Cree nation who shared and traded farming implements and animals and an item of clothing, the Ukrainian flowered scarf, also known as the kokum or the grandmother scarf. I'm wearing one today. As Jay Lee Makakis of the Saddle Lake Cree nation has said, the kokum scarf now represents solidarity against the threat of imperialism and offers an opportunity for return to tradition, ceremony, and reconnection. From river to river, from nation to nation, from the North Saskatchewan to the Dnipro in Ukraine, from the Don River to the Desna, from colonized territory to colonized territory, the Russian attack on Ukraine has shocked us all, but it has also awakened our solidarity. Ukraine, like Palestine, like the indigenous nations of Canada, has been colonized over and over again. May we continue to link our struggles for sovereignty and land back. Ukraina. Thank you. Thank you, Marusia. Um, I'm now going to introduce the uh, our, our panelists today. Um, and I'll start with Dr. Idil Abdullahi, who is an assistant professor in the School for Disability Studies at X University. Dr. Rick, Ricky Varghese is a psychotherapist in private practice and an art writer based in Toronto. He is also the inaugural Tanisto Postdoctoral Fellow in Gender, Disability, and Social Justice at X University. He recently completed his training to become a psychoanalyst through the Toronto Institute of Psycholan um, Psychoanalysis. Dr. Christopher Smith is currently a research associate at the Center for Ethics at University of Toronto with the Race, Ethics, and Power Project. Um, they received their PhD from the Department of Social Justice Education, Ontario, the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, and uh, slash University of Toronto in 2020. And their work on queer arts and culture has been commissioned by the Gardner Museum in Toronto, the Toronto Biennale of Art, and published in Drain Magazine. Uh, everyone can welcome our panelists. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Um, Abdullahi. Thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you uh, to Marusia. Thank you to the students for being there. Thank you to Mel, um, as well as the all the tech support people and the ASL interpreters as well. Um, we're really happy. Well, I'm really happy to be here, and and certainly really happy to be here. Um, alongside both of my colleagues. Um, and we're really looking forward to today's structure to really be um, a conversation in the way that we would have it amongst ourselves, right? Um, and that's sort of a part of the process and the method in our discussion um, is to really sort of just 
talk about what we're doing now and how we're doing it and um, to really interact and engage with each other based on everyday experiences, our everyday conversations that we would have with each other, whether it's on text message or using any other kind of app and really bring that together in terms of the, the broader sort of social, political, um, and larger maddening and violent moments in which we are all uh, being asked to live in at this time. So um, I thought we would just begin actually by, you know, posing a really easy question for everybody. Um, and that question is just, you know, what are we, what are we watching? What are we doing now? What kinds of media are we engaging in? Um, and given that part of the conversation and the and the course is is about social justice, um, I also want us to talk a lot about the, I think probably like the the thing the unexpected things that we watch and engage that probably might not be as, um, I think as as expected. So uh, we're gonna do it popcorn style. It is a like sort of podcast style conversation, and so uh, we will be talking and engaging with. Uh, each other for some time and obviously um, invite any of you uh, using whatever function that you can to please um, feel free and, and jump into the conversation. For folks who are engaging with us online, please feel free to pop in and out of the conversation. Um, please feel free to yes or no, or I watch that too, or whatever else that you might be feeling. Um, I think Ricky, Chris, and I tend to do much better in an informal and um, collegial kind of conversation. And so that's that's what we're gonna uh, do today. So with that, I'm going to invite maybe uh, Chris to start first, and then from there, we'll just um, keep chatting. A few of us, just for access reasons, may have our camera on and off at certain points in the presentation. Um, and if so, we can still hear, but just know that we are certainly still with you here online. Okay, Chris, you can start first. So I go first. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, uh, I mean, one of the questions that uh, when we were conceiving this event was like, well, what are we watching? But then the other part of that question is why? And uh, one of the things that I was curious about, because I'm like an unapologetic, like avid TV, like viewer, uh, primarily well, both medical dramas as well as like legal dramas. So like Law and Order franchise, I'm in heaven. Sometimes it can be all kinds of problematic, but I, I'm always curious about what uh, televisual media is trying to represent. And so when we entered into the pandemic, I was curious about the ways in which studios would then try to address the pandemic in some sort of way? What, what would be the storylines? What would be the mechanisms? What would be, uh, I guess, the moral of the story uh, that we would take from it? And so I remember in our earlier conversations talking about this episode of Law and Order SVU, uh, which was one of the first of like my favorite shows to kind of take the charge where like they were actually representing like actors wearing masks, even though technically they weren't following the actual protocol. So that was kind of vexing, like, uh, but whatever. Um, but uh, the ways in which they're trying to suggest and integrate a narrative that like the pandemic has obviously in interrupted the ways in which we understand our well-being. Uh, in relation to how they're also understanding how to uh, solve crime. And there was a particular episode that stood out for me, uh, not just because the special guest star uh, was Sarita Chowdhury, uh, one of my favorite actors of all time. Uh, but what struck me about this episode is that it follows a kind of timeline from before pandemic to into pandemic. So before pandemic, uh, she's a restaurateur in a, a very well-to-do neighborhood in Manhattan. And uh, she has a solid clientele, uh, had a very, very strong, uh, strong business. And then the pandemic hits and then there's this moment of wait. 
and waiting and waiting to see, well, what is going to be the next turn of events? Will we quote unquote return back to normal? During the course of uh, the story arc from like 2020 uh, to uh, what at the time that this episode aired would have been 2021, uh, her business is now going under. She's lost her, uh, she's lost her mother. The entire family is under duress. And the episode ends up focusing on the moment when she decides to go and take charge and hold on to property. And I was like, okay, this is going to be an interesting kind of showdown because she literally like holds the real estate agent at gunpoint. She's like, I'm not giving up my restaurant. I've given up my blood, sweat, and tears for this. And this moment is happening at the same time that uh, more and more cities are recognizing that police forces need to learn de-escalation. And so while she's inside, uh, you have Lieutenant Olivia Benson, who's like the main protagonist of the show, uh, trying to hold the cops back saying, I have de-escalation training. I'm going to go in and they're like, no, we're not going to let you go in by yourself. And she's like, no, I know this person because she's also clientele. And the episode is about both de-escalation, but it's also about well, what can make us mad in this moment, especially in relationship to capital? Because the premise of the episode is that I'm losing this restaurant, but the restaurant was the glue that kept the family together, or so we're supposed to infer. Uh, without spoilers, uh, I mean, obviously, an episode on de-escalation would not end without uh, the, uh, the incident uh, not being, uh, without the incident being just de-escalated. But what struck me in terms of the way in which they wanted to close the episode, what got her to uh, stop the siege is that clientele all of a sudden started a GoFundMe campaign. And I thought to myself, wow, so this is where we're at. So. Under, the, under this current, con, you know, uh, what uh, Olofemi uh, Taiwo would call compound crises, the way in which to alleviate madness or a break of some sort is to say, we've got your back through GoFundMe. We're contributing to capital, we're ensuring that you still maintain a place within the system. And so, I mean, that's one of like first, like the first examples that jump out for me. Uh, I mean, I would throw the torch to Ricky. Um, you know, I, um, hi. <laughs> hi, everyone. Uh, it's really nice to be here. Um, and I'm happy to participate in this event. Um, I, for me, the Ill's question about what are we watching is an interesting question. I mean, I can, I can tell you what I'm watching, but I guess the more interesting kind of aspect of that question is what are we not watching? Or, or um, is it possible to stop watching stuff? Because I feel that one thing that has kind of happened to me over the pandemic and also in this age of, kind of social media is that they're constantly looking and watching and observing. There's always this kind of endless sense of mediation that we are kind of exposed to. Um, whether it is on uh, mainstream media or social media, I feel like I'm always kind of expected to be looking at stuff nonstop and, and watching stuff nonstop. Um, and and I'm, I'm 
fascinated by that. Um, and even the most recent uh, uh, events that have, have played out in the list in Ukraine, it's interesting to me that I, I, I'm, not on, I, I'm not on Facebook. I, I deactivated my Facebook a while back. I'm not on Twitter because I, I don't like Twitter. The only social media that I'm, I'm on is, uh, is Instagram. And it's been really interesting to me to sort of observe how people understand a kind of historical event and the kind of discourse or the kind of commentary that's happening around it. Um, and the, 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 the obsession that following the event as it plays out, or uh, the, the, the desire for people to have an opinion about what's going on. It's, I find that really interesting to me that there's, it is about social, social media, uh, which is what I find most fascinating, is that everyone has an opinion about everything. Everyone has become an expert on everything. And I, I, I wonder about what that means um, in, the, in, the, in the larger context of how we relate to information, how we relate to knowledge, how we relate to the consumption of both information and knowledge, and and what what it means for our mental health in some of us. The constant barrage of information that we are being kind of exposed to. Um, so and that's sort of where I want to start the conversation, is I want to start the conversation by thinking carefully about the, the way in which we are constantly being um, exposed to information without having the opportunity or the time to process that information. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, stop my comments there and, and, and just leave it there for now. Bill? Yeah, thanks so much. I think from both what um, uh, Ricky and, and Chris, you've both said, one of the things that um, becomes like a stark kind of contrast for me is what displays and or um, presentations of quote madness or mental health have we seen increasingly, particularly since the pandemic, right? And so I also think that that's a really important kind of discourse and story and narrative to think about insofar as I would invite um, the folks listening on this chat as well as this, the um, my colleagues sitting in the classroom there to think about Every time we've seen madness or mental health displayed on TV prior to um, the COVID-19 pandemic, we, taught, we, we tended to see it in these kind of really grandiose ways, the murderer on CSI, right? We um, tend to see it in terms of the person that's being looked for um, on you know, one of these shows or something of that nature. And so a part of me has been looking at and watching the way that, quote, mental health has been taken up and notions of isolation and so forth, <clears throat> excuse me, increasingly in, in, in public discourse and particularly in social media, and not even just social media, in media in general, right? This kind of attempt to resolve out this thing that all of a sudden now the assumption is that we are all facing and that we're all facing in the same way. And so one of my offerings and invitation in this discussion is actually to think about um, the ways that we've, of course, made madness neoliberal, but we've also made a certain kind of mental health acceptable, permissible, and in fact, so much so that we've taken it up everywhere, but there's certain people left out of that conversation. 
right? And even in these kind of commercial and corporate depictions of mental health and madness, even in some of their like most, um, you know, um, social justice-y kind of ways, like I'm thinking of um, a show that I watch on, on HBO, um, quite often that 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 has a you know really great gender and queer kind of lens to it that's quite interesting and unique um, but then ultimately in terms of the representation around that there's not um, the kind of representations that we often tend to see are like bad mad representations right they're like criminal mad they're pathologizing mad they're all the problematic mads right and so I, I I guess as I'm watching what I don't want to do is to like really hold on to this idea of, well, we're seeing things about madness or mental health in the media, so that means something. Quite similarly in the way that, um, you know, we've seen the real kind of, and we can go and talk about this a bit later on, but like the kind of response to um, the killing of George Floyd um, and the push towards equity and diversity across um, all social media outlets and the way that even that's a media outlet story and like studios and productions, you can think about Survivor, you can think about Big Brother, um, shit, you can think about the damn Bachelor and the Bachelorette too, let's add them up in there. Okay, so when we think about that, the real kind of like bastardization of blackness the real kind of like tenuous ways that it's being um, brought in in a kind of really problematic way within the discourse. So I guess those are some of the um, those are those are some of the things that come to my mind in general. And then in terms of what I'm watching, I'll answer the questions about what I'm watching. Um, so I'm watching every single uh, all the Real Housewives franchise, every city, including Salt Lake City. I'm caught up. Um, I'm watching Ready to Love. Um, I watched Love is Blind. Um, I'm really proud of Deep T for not marrying and picking um, Shake. Thank God. Um, uh, what else? What else am I thinking about here? What else am I watching? Um, you know, I like I watch everything that everybody else watches, right? Um, quite joyously and quite frankly, without any guilt. Um, and, and I consume it and I consume even the problematic things. That doesn't mean that I'm not thinking critically or questioning and laughing as I'm watching the fact that nobody's eating on the Real Housewives franchise, but I'm hungry, but everyone's flicking around food and I'm still here for it, right? Um, so I'll leave it there. I don't know, Marisha, if, if you have any um, questions that maybe you want to throw in as we're chatting, feel free to do so. Oh no, keep talking, it's great. Chris, you're on mute. Chris, I uh, sorry about that. No, so it, so it all is interesting because like it come, it ties back into uh, uh, Ricky's first offering in terms of well, why are we compelled to keep watching? And like I'm recalling just kind of this drive to make sure that I had something to fill space and time, and so. Uh, unapologetically, I'm still on Facebook uh, for the news. No, I'm kidding. Um, to, you know, touch base with friends and whatnot. But, uh, but, you know, getting recommendations from folks and you start to see this trend, especially, and it started for me like in uh, like spring 2020, when we realized that we we're going to be locked down a little bit more and then all of a sudden people are rec uh, asking for recommendations for shows uh, because what else are you going to do with your time and then thinking about that where I'm just like it's like well don't I want to do anything else like is there something else that I could do to uh, I don't know understand the moment differently and starting to recognize within myself, it's just like, am I just trying to fill space and time so I'm not like, you know, feeling like isolation gonna get me? I mean, in the winter time, I'm usually hibernating anyway, so I probably would have been doing that. But now, all of a sudden, I'm just like watching shows that I wouldn't even seek out, but because they came highly recommended, and so, uh, so it'll it, this kind of kind of. Uh, connects again in terms of well, what do we choose to watch in these moments? Like, and how are they functioning for us? Are we watching things that 
are meant to lift our spirits and how we come to understand that these are the things that are going to be go to, to lift our spirits, to take us out of a state of isolation or potential madness or what that might look like. I also wanted to throw out something else though, because, uh, and maybe this is something we can touch on a little bit later, but I've always been, uh, well, shamelessly giggling at, because uh, you meant because uh, Italy you mentioned the whole kind of corporate uh, investment in mental health, and thinking about the ways in which the Bell Let's Talk ads take on a different kind of tenor. Because I'm just like, well, what do you want to talk about now that we've been isolated for a year? Who exactly is being addressed in this moment? When on an annual basis, like, well, we should be talking all the time, but. Yes, end of January, let's talk. Yeah, no, totally. Um, and, you know, to your point around like, you know, what are we doing? Are we using the time to like pass time or fill time or to not do any of these things? I think, you know, look, I'll be really honest. I was watching as much TV before the pandemic as I was during the pandemic. It's just that during the pandemic, Okay, everyone else felt like it was okay to talk about the fact that they're sitting at home watching the Bake Off, right? Um, because there's also a lot of kind of shame, I think, around the kinds of things and like cultural production that people consume based on like certain kind of ideas around um, knowing what quote good media is and how to consume that and all these other kinds of things. But um, in terms of like, for me, I purposefully choose to watch white women's madness on TV because it's, it's, they're, they're buying bags and stupidity. So let me go watch white people's mess. Like I, I live real issues. I live with like real shit. Right. So I will watch, um, what, what's happening, um, in New York on real housewives. I will watch the white people on summer house. I don't have a summer house, but why the hell can't I watch them fight and hug each other up and do all kind of shippiness? I don't mind, right? No, no it is. I, 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 you know, it's it's the same with me also. Is that I don't watch any more TV as a result of the, the pandemic than I was watching before. And I watch, I, I watch everything. That, is on the Housewives franchise. I watch Summer House. I watch, I watch Love and Hip Hop. I watch all of it. And I've been very really proud of the fact that I watch all of it. Because of the fact that, you know, I, you know, I, 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 I enjoy, I, you know, I, I, I'm in the process of becoming a psychoanalyst right now, and I, I, think I learn more about people and their unconscious and their mental health by consuming so called of reality TV than I do in um, any other aspect, right? And so it's, it's really interesting that it's something of a pandemic has allowed us to become more comfortable in admitting that we consume certain forms of media, which I, I find fascinating. You know, people call it completely pleasant, or people call it, you know, in, 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 people have this way of having shame at what they consume. And I, I never under, fully understood that because ultimately there, there is no shame in finding pleasure in what we consume. <laughs> I did, I think, yeah, I totally get it. And I think, I guess maybe for me, what I, or what I wonder, or what I think about is that it's not so much about necessarily like what they're watching, but I wonder if it's like this idea about um, being productive. Cause if you are telling people that you're watching trash TV, then it means that you're not being productive. And if you're not being productive, then what does that say about you? Um, whereas now the pandemic has occurred or the pandemic is occurring and there's this idea that somehow, you know, productivity may look different, et cetera. Right. So I, I guess to me, I think about both like the 
content of what we're consuming, but then also like the broader idea of like telling on ourselves for these things that are supposed to be, um, yeah, about pleasure, right? Which is then the other piece as well, which is that yeah. there's a denial of pleasure, whatever that pleasure may look like um, in that time. Hi, my name is, <laughs> hold on. Hi, my name is Christopher. I watch Jersey Shore. I'm dead. <laughs> I used to claim that I watched it just because my students would reference it in papers, but I'm fully confident enough now to admit I love these folks getting all kinds of trashy and getting into all kinds of hot mess because like it means that, wow, even I'm respectable by comparison. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm respectable by comparison and Anyone who knows me would say that I'm the last person to like try and get on the platform of respectability. And I'm just like, wow, okay. Like, I don't understand where this is like, this is going. And I've talked with friends of mine who are also psychoanalysts or interested in psychoanalysis and culture. And I'm just like, I don't understand the show. And like one, you know, a mutual colleague of, uh, of ours uh, had mentioned at one point, it's like, I love the show. It's just such raw affect. And I'm just like, no, be crazy. But okay, I'll embrace that though. It's raw affect. So I don't have to feel guilty anymore. Like I'm examining the show for raw affect. But why is it so guilty? I think this is the thing about I think it's fascinating also, especially amongst academics that we are so ashamed of what we watch. Every time I uh, you know, talk about watching the Real Housewives or watching, you know, Love and Hip Hop or watching, you know, whatever it is that I'm watching, you know, people are surprised that I watch that kind of stuff. Because why wouldn't I watch that? Because there's this fantasy that people have that as academics that we consume highbrow stuff. And I mean, I consume a lot of highbrow stuff, I, I, a lot. But I also watch a lot of other stuff. It is such a kind of um, classes and kind of uh, fucked up to assume that as academics we don't consume things that are outside of fully of what people imagine us to consume, right? I don't know if that makes sense, but I I I I don't I don't feel I need to justify why I watch certain things. I watch it purely because it, it gives me some pleasure. And I enjoy watching The Housewives. I enjoy watching date loss because there's something about it that allows me uh, a certain amount of excitement, a certain amount of pleasure, a certain amount of joy. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, but that's where I'm coming from. Oh, were you waiting for me to respond? <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. Oh, Ricky, I think you're on mute. Um, no, I wasn't. I, well, I, I wasn't going to respond to to that per se. But I think then I guess the other thing that it makes me think about or like that I start thinking about are um, we, oh, Frank, I guess we know a lot of what we watch is scripted. We know that even when it's reality, it's not reality. Um, and so then I think about not just us as we have this conversation, but in general, what we expect then to be shown in um, in public life, right? Both as we think about like the responses to it, the poor responses to it, as we think about like, you know, um, how terrible we think that like corporate and mainstream media is. Then simultaneously, like we're having this conversation about like madness and media. So there's like this contention about like, or I want us to maybe talk about this contention about like what we expect from these, horrible spaces right um or spaces that we know are so contrived in many ways and like mm -hmm. i think for me the things that i'm interested in other than when i'm watching white mess um is really like about good honest like tv or like 
um, things that I'm interested in as a Black person, as a person that belongs to a bunch of different communities, but um, that might not be there, right? And so those are, again, like just um, things that I continue to like consider. Like every time I watch um, Sister Wives, um, I watch that too, quite often. Um, I'm caught up on that show as well. But um, what I know is Muhammad would not have his four wives on a TLC TV show, right? We need to get very clear about that immediately, right? Um, and so these are, but again, right? Like these are the kinds of contentions. And then I'm like annoyed with myself for when I ask that knowing Muhammad and his four wives, okay, are never going to be on that television. And if they are, it's because he's going to be wanted for act of terrorism on law and order right? Mm -hmm. So these are the kinds of contentions, I think, that we really, um, that, that we have to consider, we have to take up, right? So I think that's, yeah. Certain, certain bodies that it's expected to kind of hold on it up certain positions, right? That there are days in which they're all supposed to occupy certain kinds of narratives. And they're not allowed to exist outside of it, those narratives. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess then maybe to, to come back to like both the like the not to come back, because I think all of it is maddening, to be honest. Um, and again, I think that that idea of, of everything um, that we're seeing being really maddening kinds of processes and really thinking about um, even our experience of it. One of the things that I guess I, um, Ricky, to come back to your question is then what are the things that we're not engaging and why aren't we engaging those things? Um, and how does that relate to like what you described around either desire or just Chris for like our own relaxation and mental health? Like what are those things that are that are um, like sites or markers of like disinterest or so forth? Mm -hmm. I could jump in. Uh, I mean, it's on a day-to-day -day basis for me. I mean, I've got my, you know, I've got my regular shows that I'm, you know, uh, very uh, committed to. Uh, and then, you know, as we've seen, you know, during the course of the pandemic that like uh, uh, the mainstream, like television networks have been dealing with all kinds of different uh, hiatuses in terms of what can be produced and in what kind of frequency. And so that provides me with a gap where all of a sudden I need to find something else to fill the space. And I'm just like, well, yeah. why, don't, why don't I read a book? And I'm just like, but you read all the time. Like, what, like, what else could I find? And I found myself uh, at certain points, especially depending on what the events of the day are, seeking out films that I've seen before that I know will give me a certain kind of sensation of feeling good or in other cases feeling vindicated and so like i remember like long time back a good friend of mine had a very uh challenging uh not just well challenging would almost minimize it but a very uh vexing like workplace situation going on and you know you she's feeling this you know this rage and i'm just like watch Silence of the Lambs. Hmm. Like just what, like watch Silence of the Lambs. I ain't gonna think any less of you girl. Like It's the most beautiful revenge movie to watch if you need some sort of catharsis. And so, I mean, for me, it's like, again, it, for me, it varies on my mood because ultimately, and I don't know whether that's my own kind of self-management because I uh, live on my own where it's like, I don't want to watch anything that's going to upset me too much because I am living on my own. And so, and definitely don't want my neighbors because I already yell at my TV enough as it is. But uh, 
especially if I'm watching the news. So that would be one thing that I tend to avoid, <clears throat> or at least televisual news. Uh, because I'll find me find myself saying very frequently, are you fucking kidding me? Like, and thinking, what do my neighbors think of me? Like, and then thinking, well, I don't give a shit. Like, but it's just like, it's interesting in terms of thinking about like this question around choice, what we choose not to and what we do choose to. I mean, I, it's partly individual. And I think that's also part of it is that uh, we become so isolated in our viewing that we become very selective based on that point because we're looking for something that's going to ensure individual comfort as opposed to a different kind of time and place where like, you know, me and my girlfriends would like, you know, in the 90s would, you know, rush home from work to watch Melrose Place as a group or like order a pizza and it was like a collective thing. Whereas now, it still it hasn't lost a collective component, but it's a different moment when you're con consuming because you're watching it individually while going through social media saying, oh my God, epi Ozark episode four. Like, what was that? Like, again, I guess like I'm adjusting to different kinds of times because I'm, I'm used to that kind of collective watching or being on the phone and be like, girl, did you just see what like, what like Lieutenant Benson did or whatever, or like, it's like, oh my God, girl, McDreamy died. Like, it's just like, and so, I mean, I guess those are the things that I kind of wanted to put on the table because it's like, we're consuming based on these new dynamics where uh, in many ways, they're not as intimate as the way that we used to consume. I think Chris, that's like a really good point because I, um, during the pandemic, I learned about this thing called watch party. Okay. So I'm sure other people already knew about it, but I didn't. And like you invite, I guess your friends or your people them to watch the thing that you're watching at the same time. And it was good at first. Cause I felt like everybody I knew was like in a space together and I too live alone and was like, oh, okay, well, this seems kind of cool, but one, it wasn't the same. And then the chat thing on the side really kind of does you in, especially with the people who love to comment a lot. Um, and then so like it just so the way technology has also mediated what that is, of course, I think a lot about um, and that, yeah, I, I don't necessarily think that it made that better. I do like the the theme of like watching things together. I like pausing and still calling friends. I do that with with you people um <laughs> as we're watching things but like those are the kinds of um things that i i think also take away even i think probably before the pandemic right is that um all the ways in which we think that access makes things better or may bring people closer together and by access just to be clear i'm talking about like technology um that really also then like ensures kind of continued distant relationships right um, but Ricky, I think you were going to say something. Um, I, 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 I'm curious about what kind of relationships are formed, right? In, you know, in, in, in that kind of act of watching a show or commiserating on something that they're consuming, I wonder what kinds of social relationships are being formed, right? I mean, I know that if I watch something, I'm kind of asking friends about it and kind of commiserating about what I just watch and kind of there's a kind of community that is being formed as a result of that. And I, I, I'm fascinated by the uh, 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 the way in which that community has a kind of power, and it's something that I've noticed, especially in a pandemic, where we've, we've been kind of had forced to um, kind of stay in place, watch shows, and kind of um, 
Zoom in a way that allows us to uh, consume ends in isolation, but also in relationship to each other. Um, and I wonder about what that means, uh, especially as we come out of this pandemic also. There's what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about is, you know, what is the afterlife of this moment? Uh, what is what comes after a pandemic? You know, how do we, how do we think about media? How do we think about mediation? How do we think about consuming the objects that we have been consuming after this moment? Do you mean arguments in terms of the way in which the pandemic is being narrated within particular media platforms or sources or? I mean, in general, like, what does it mean to consume media after this pandemic? You know, like, not just about the pandemic, but about, you know, you know how do we think about media? Because the pandemic has been, has been a really fascinating period in, in you know, like media, there's a lot of talk about fake news or fake information or and, you know, making sure that our, our sources are correct and making sure that what they're consuming is legitimate and accurate and all of that. And I've been thinking about what it means to come out of this pandemic and in about media outside of the context of this moment that we have been living in for the last few years. But I guess that's, I mean, that's, the, I mean, that's the challenge in terms of your question, because immediately my first response is that the age of misinformation began well before the pandemic, well before 2010, probably well before 2008 when like Obama, uh, Obama was elected or even when he was campaigning. Like there's been already like a kind of a building kind of uh, cult of mis misinformation, let's just say. And so I, I'm kind of curious how I would answer uh, your question precisely because there's no guarantees that somehow when uh, uh, when the pandemic is over, that somehow that means that we're going to come out more woke, or <laughs> that we're going to be more inclined to be critical, inclined to be uh, looking for uh, legitimate or more truthful stories or more accurate stories, because the question of truth and the question of accuracy uh, is continually being posed, but it's been being, but it has been posed for quite some time. And so like, I, I, I love your question. I just wish that I had an answer for it. I'm glad that I don't, because I'm curious to see where this is going to go as well. And I think, Chris, you bring up a really good point that this idea of misinformation and disinformation, in fact, has been ongoing for some time. Um, and I think the, the real critical nuance is um, at what junctures do we actually begin to name things as misinformation and disinformation, right? In what context, regarding who, regarding what circumstances? Because I think that what you're pointing us to is in fact that we have seen um, mis and disinformation throughout history ongoing, but there's specific things that both like the media and, and we all kind of take up as more urgent or take more seriously, right? And I think if anything, the um, the, the COVID-19 and the pandemic situation here has proven to us that um, we are certainly not all consuming media in the same way. We're not all going to the same places for our media. Um, we are not all um, understanding or, or even often maybe um, speaking to the very people that we think we may be, right? Um, and so I think that's been something that's been really interesting um, to pay attention to and to really watch. Um, for me, even that's maddening, right? 
um, beginning to like engage with and understand how people, um, whether or not, again, have access to information, the way people take up that information, right? Um, but also the way I think for me, um, hello? Hello? Oh, so I'm here. Oh, okay, no, I heard like a weird sound. No, sorry, no, sorry, that was my computer telling oh, me. That okay, I'm my here. bad. <laughs> sorry. That, that, was, that was my bad. No, no, sorry, it's my bad. I, maybe I should have just know to keep going now that we're in Zoom days. But um, anyway, so that I think those are some of the things that that I'm thinking about, and um, I I really do continue to think about in in serious ways and and try to um, consider. But I think uh, Ricky, I think you were going to say something. I, you know, it, 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 what's interesting <laughs> is uh, is this idea. I mean, I'm yeah, I'm. I, mean, I think it's important. It, it's in this kind of what we want from um, what we find ourselves in that in, which is social media. And I'm actually really interested in how social media um, makes it appear that there's something very democratic and something very um, it has an area about how we consume it. And I think the point that it illuminates about how we all consume it in very different ways is very um, useful to think about because there's this presumption in social media or in, in um, various social media platforms that they're all consuming it in the same way. And I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that um, social media, much like any other form of media, is informed by all kinds of power structures. And we consume it depending upon our very specific social location, our very specific identity, our very specific geopolitical um, affiliations or alliances. And I think it's really important to kind of acknowledge that. Uh, acknowledge the different ways in which we consume media, but also social media, and how we also consume forms of information, um, if that makes sense. I think just kind of, add, I mean, adding to that, uh, just thinking about how we're directed to particular kinds of uh, content, by way of algorithm. And so what does it mean that Facebook is trying to insinuate that I'm having a bad day by all of a sudden dropping a whole bunch of like cat videos? Like, not that I don't love cats and I love puppies too, but it's just like, what makes you, but we also participate in this kind of mediation where uh, we recirculate all of these different memes as a, with the premise that uh, I don't know if you need this today, but here you go. And it's like, what sorts of presumptions are we making about our state of being in relation to mental health during that time? And what are we also revealing about ourselves uh, in the moment of posting? You know, it, this is probably not related at all, but what that makes me think about um, it's like when people post on, you know, Twitter or on any of these things, uh, medias like, oh, hi, everybody, I'm going to be taking a, won't be, I'm taking a hiatus from this place. Like, it's a job. Like, somebody <laughs> told you you had to be here. Like, someone told you you had to clock in. <laughs> like, right? So, like, this idea of, like, this, um, like one, like this idea of like what people may need or not need, but like, why are you clocking into the timeline? Like you can just not tell nobody nothing, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you hold it too, right? Like these are the things I think no about. No shade, no shade. No, no, it's not even, listen, I have friends that do that stuff. Like, you know what I mean? Like shout out, I love you all, right? But like, I just think to myself, 
but when did we make this like work? Like, this is not an email signature. We're, I'm not your employer. You don't owe me anything. I come to your timeline for information to laugh, right? But it's it's this idea of like responding to or or having to engage or be, I don't know, I don't know what it is, but it, it's similar to this thing about like, you know, does Facebook think I'm having a bad day? Or like, you know, when you happen to, for me, I always get messages from like the food apps, right? Oh, did you know that there's a burger in your cart or something? And I'm like, what? Right. So yeah, absolutely. The algorithm, you, you all know you got, you get that too. I'm not going to say from what place, right. Or it'll be like, ding, ding. It's like two for one for something. And the truth is you don't have any food in your fridge. And maybe you may have opened Instacart earlier that day and not finished. Right. Um, and so absolutely things are being med uh, mediated through social media. Um, uh, I think, uh, you know, and, and even the way we're being told uh, to, I'm writing something about this now, um, but the way we're being told to use apps increasingly, right? So on the one hand, we want people to like take, you know, we know that the internet is according to like research and data, like it's not the best for people. Um, we want some folks to be able to stay off of it. But then on the other hand, we are putting all these quote unquote apps accessible to people online um, which aren't free because they're digging out your data. They want your business in those apps, right? And ultimately, the other part of it is there's no outcome from that, from engaging in that service. So you, there's no more, there's no housing, there's no anything that you may actually need, right? Um, and so for us to really think about like, what are some of these pushes in general um, that are, are, we're being pushed to digitize in, in more ways than one, right? Um, and certainly, I'm not saying that some of these, you know, um, technological advances aren't 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 helpful for some. But I think that we have to be critical about them, right? We have to look at like the connection between, you know, the algorithms, apps, and like um, corporations, and and how businesses and like f businesses function, and how data is collected, and how yes, then it tells people stories about who we are in the internet. That happens, right? And and in the internet world. Um, but yeah, I think I went on a bit of a tangent there, Chris. Sorry. Oh, I do, you know, I'm kind of fascinated by that, that, that uh, point that you made about how to let this announcement about it and it, off social media as if it, it's some kind of look, or some kind of label, and then it must impulse to announce one's exit or one's break or one's sabbatical from forms of media. And I wonder about why 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 that is why that happens. You know, why is why is it that this is understood as a new form of labor or a new form of work? You know, just being online and being plopped in a lot on, um, if that makes sense. But I think it's also because I think part of part of it is that uh, social media facilitates, whether real or imagined, a sense that those who are in your circle uh know that you're okay and so it's almost as if like we make these pronouncements that like i need to take a break because sometimes you have to actually explain why you need to take a break and they'll be like are you okay i haven't seen you on facebook in a while and it's just like maybe i just don't want to be saturated by whatever is flowing through my feed like uh and so um, uh yeah that I, I know it's uh, like, I agree, I agree that on the one hand it's been constructed as a kind of labor, but it's an emotional labor. I mean, it's, ver it's very much an emotional labor in terms of once you've created a kind of public presence, the assumption is that you're obligated now to tell, you know, tell whatever is your public vis-a-vis -vis your friends list that you're taking a hiatus and actually that's quite like fascinatingly kind of narcissistic like 
like I know who my people are. Like if I if I just like stop posting on Facebook, if someone's gonna get worried, they just text me or call me. But that's but, it. And that's so, it. And so this idea that we have to make this pronouncement like is fascinating to me because otherwise it's just like it does feel uh, it does feel like it can feel kind of narcissistic like. I'm important enough to tell you that I'm no longer going to be posting whatever the hell it is that I post. Like, but then again, that's just one interpretation because again, we all engage in these media forums from different vantage points and have different kind of affective relations to them. And so I can't say for certain why one would make the declaration or not. I just know why I wouldn't. I just try and like do some kind of like cold turkey, just don't open the app. And that says something about me as well in terms of why am I still beholden to this thing? Right now I blame it on Wordle, but that's okay. <laughs> I don't know if there are any um, questions or any comments so far. Um, it, if, if there's anybody who would like to maybe ask something or um, pose something before we, we've been talking for a little bit, um, are, is there any thoughts coming to folks? Because yeah. we've got 20 minutes left, so. Well, this has been uh, such a fun kind of kitchen table conversation and um, I love all the um, the points that you've brought up. TV as a bad object versus television as a site of pleasure. The the constant tension between that and the way that shame lives in the space in between. Um, uh, I'm always interested in television as a resource for identity, um, and as a queer viewer, I feel like you know I'm very good at sort of reading between the lines and taking what I need and then trashing the rest, um, finding points of identification and disidentification, which leads me to sex in the city. Oh. <laughs> I'm dying to ask about that. Um, what's the new one called? And, and just like, like that. that. So, um, so one thing, you know, I mean, sex in the city is, has always been, you know, both, um, really sort of problematic in terms of its class representation, but it always manages to pick up on the zeitgeist, sometimes in awkward ways. And so obviously very consciously, they've picked up on Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, and, and they've talked about this as producers. They've now inserted Black characters and they're representing, you know, um, friendship and allyship between the white characters and the black characters with, cer with certain moments of, of tension. So I, I'm just curious to know what you think of that and whether any of that is salvageable or interesting. So, I mean, the first, I mean, uh, so Marisha, you, like you like jump in right from the get-go saying, you know, there's always been some class issues. And so even though they're trying to address feedback and criticism that have come from especially like black like black queer and feminist uh, uh, viewers back uh, well before like you know the first iter like the first iteration uh, they're trying to correct it but the only people that they engage with are people of the same class and so the character from Miranda becomes really good friend you know really good friends with uh, her professor uh, Charlotte becomes really good friends with someone in the PTA at an elite school. And so like, they're not marching in the streets. Like we ain't gonna see Carrie Bradshaw like she never wears flats. <laughs> and, like we ain't gonna see her, we ain't gonna see Carrie Bradshaw in heels, you know, you know, mar like marching, you know, marching in the streets at all. I mean, and so it's, there's something seductive about it because like during the time that I was watching it and also following like blogs where it's just like you have like folks that considered themselves loyal Sex in the City fans 
that now all of a sudden skip ahead to, you know, 2021, 22 are just like asking themselves, why did I like this show to begin with? I don't understand. Like, what did they do to me back in 2020, 2021? Like, and so it's, it's, it's very fascinating to see because we still watch it anyway, whether it's out of obligation or some sort of sense of, I guess, for lack of a better word, loyalty. Uh, I mean, for me, I was kind of watching it as an experiment to see like at what point is it gonna go off the rails? Mm. And clearly it did because like in the representation of Sarah, uh, Sarah Ramirez, uh, Ramirez character, Che, uh, there were folks that were very adamantly like, this is like a very horrible representation of like non, you know, of non, uh, non-binary people. And, I guess the thing that struck me when I saw this discourse taking place was just like, but what archive are we referring to? Hmm. Like, do we actually have an archive to base this uh, this reaction to the representation? Uh, and I guess I'm thinking about this in relation to because I because uh, I did my master's in film uh, film studies and. For me, it was all about the archive. If you're looking at audience re uh, audience reception, the first thing that you have to consider is, well, what archives are people looking to to suggest that this is a better or a worse representation or a misrepresentation? And that's one of the things that's been sitting with me with that particular show. It's like, but what are we comparing the, like Sarah, uh, Sarah Ramirez's character's representation to? Like, can we actually say like in earnest that there's like this widespread representation of non-binary non non -binary char non characters that are also adults? Mm -hmm. Well, in some ways, um, uh, the, the subtext, the ways in which we had to find queerness in subtext in Hollywood and um, uh, was was maybe more powerful than these sort of very literal kinds of characters like oh one of each here's your non-binary and here's okay. your um you know white bisexual woman um but the work that we had to do to 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 find find those identities within ostensibly heterosexual narratives. I think that was very interesting, a very interesting sort of labor that we had to do. Anyways, um, anybody in the class have a question? <laughs> Hard to put you on the spot. Okay, do you wanna just say it and I'll amplify it? Yeah, or come over here, yeah. That's even better. Okay, we have a, a question from the floor. speak over there, should be fine. Over there? Like in front of you. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you're um, Hi. Um, oh. We're talking about obviously mental health in relation Can't to. Can't see you. Should I? Just in front of you. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. It's the laptop. Yeah. 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 Um, hi. Um, so you're talking about mental health obviously in relation to um, watching media and it's kind of like a form of escapism in a way. But just, I guess, as an opinion piece, do you think that is detrimental to mental health and using this media to escape from your current reality? Or do you think that is helpful in a way? Great question. I'm going to let Ricky take that one first because I definitely know he will have a nuanced answer, not to put you on the spot, but like. I mean, I guess the thing is that I feel that it's, it's not always a bad thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I think there are ways in which we are all trying to escape parts of our lives that are complicated and uh, stressful. Um, and I don't think that escape is necessarily a good or a bad thing. I think it's something that we all do. Um, in different ways, and um, I feel that perhaps uh, the more important question to ask is, what is it that we are escaping? Or uh, what is it that we are trying to uh, 
uh, it, uh, it a great fun when we are escaping from something. Um, and, and is it possible for us to kind of process that and understand it and explore it in, in ways that are more uh, productive and generative? So I, 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 it, I don't think that it in, in and of itself is a, is a bad thing. I, it, and it's something that we all do, and I think uh, we, we have to do it because you know, life is complex and it's complicated, and the world is a very, very challenging place to exist in, and, and sometimes we need a break. <laughs> so. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I think uh, the only thing that I have to, I, or I would add to that, would be um, so I'm I'm not a I'm, I'm not that kind of a doctor, so I generally don't give anybody any advice or tell them what to do. Rather, I tell them what I won't do. Um, so I don't I I won't offer a response about whether or not something is good for somebody. I think that people um, inherently have their own capacity to manage and mitigate themselves whether that is for doing it for too long sometimes or doing it not long enough. I think that that's something that um, I trust individuals to do. I trust individuals to also use those spaces um, subversively, find communities and stories that are like theirs, right? Um, or like yours, find um, mad communities, find uh, queer communities, trans communities, black communities, whatever community that you're a part of, um, whether you're a part of like, uh, you know, the if you're Muslim, whatever community that you may be in, um, I think that there's a part of that that may be helpful uh, in thinking through um, what that is. And it's just really thinking about how um, not using, like sort of not thinking of it as, as an either or, um, but also for us to really consider not understanding um, mental health as a soul like as, as a pathology only right mm -hmm. and and that's why sort of earlier in the beginning of this conversation i pointed us to the fact that we've we are having a particularized conversation about mental health right now in mainly largely in relation to the pandemic right and so i invite people to think about who isn't in that conversation but then also um every time that we are sort of expanding a category or making something more normative there's still people that are on the peripheries of that conversation and discussion um yeah so i think that's what i would say to that and just really quickly on on sex in the city um you know look in my opinion um those white women are as boring as they were before Right? Like, I love the outfits. Like, let me be really clear. Like, I'm not even going to waste time on that. I love the apartments. I love the stuff. I love it. Right? I stopped watching once we got to the Diwali um, episode. Oh, yes. So that's what that's when I, you know, that's when my back broke. I was done then. Right? But look, these little white girls are running around the place. Um, and so the couple of things that stick out in my mind, okay? Um, the first thing that's really interesting for me is I'm a professor and I don't know why every time there's a black woman professor on TV, she's depicted in a very specific kind of way. But that said, I also live in the real world and I know that if I treated a white woman student like that, my ass would be grass, period. So I don't know where we would be going shopping and hand holding and whatever. I don't think that would happen. Let's be clear. Okay. Um, the other really annoying thing was, I don't know their names, but the white girl who made friends with the black woman, um, when she went over to her house, it turns out that the white woman is the expert on the art still, right? Mm -hmm. So like there's oh, a- oh, Charlotte. Of, well, yeah, it's all, all nasty. Sudden, all of a sudden that's right? a cute, that's I'm a cute done. It's nasty. It's all nasty. The outfits are cute, but like, I'm not buying it. Whatever you're selling, I don't want it. And I stopped at Diwali and I'm going to leave that there. <laughs> now, um, Anyone else have a question? You know, it's a little bit of an awkward, you can just vocalize it and I can repeat it if, if you'd rather. Um, or anyone in the audience, um, you can put your question in the chat.
Um, so where is, where do you see TV going after the pandemic and our relationship to, to TV, especially in relation to, you know, that since we're talking about madness and, and um, uh, how, or even in this moment of war, just to, you know, bring it back to that, um, what what role can can television play as we're trying to come to a point of healing and being in community? I'm cynical. I don't expect it to do a healing function. I'm, I wouldn't ex I wouldn't necessarily expect it to. At least, uh, not I or let me rephrase. I don't expect it to or make that demand of television. Um, and so I am curious as to kind of how creatives are going to imagine what the next couple of years are in terms of what kinds of ideas can be pitched. Uh, if the presumption is that like, we, you know, we've been going through a pandemic, so all of a sudden it's gonna be a lot of feel good, like we're gonna be going in a feel good direction as opposed to, uh, some of the more very gritty kinds of programs that are available on, you know, networks like Netflix and Amazon, that sort of thing. Um, who knows? But I, I, I can't say that I expect them to or necessarily want them to, because I will probably still watch regardless what's out there just the same, mm -hmm. based on my own interests and curiosities. Like, I'll be excited when like the Criminal Minds reboot comes back. <laughs> well, and also, you know, TikTok is is really interesting in relation to TV and the way that, I mean, people have always made stuff in relation to media, but uh, the kinds of sort of short narratives that people are creating, um, you know, uh, sort of points to possibly a different future as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think the only other um, maybe thought that I would have in terms of like um, media more generally, because it's interesting, we're talking about the TV, but I don't even know how many people still even own a TV these days, right? Um, but I, so I'm, I'm thinking about um, what would be helpful or useful. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Um, what would be helpful or useful, I think, is, is um, sort of a more nuanced or critical kind of a, approach to, to, to telling a story and a narrative, right? Because again, in the context of war, um, as we've seen, even the taking up of this particular war um, and, and the descendants upon um, their Ukrainian peoples, we see that that um, narrative, that story is being taken up in a very particular kind of way. Right. And so that's important. We're not we're not having discussions about, for example, the black people who are being left behind and the closed mm -hmm. doors. That's not what we're seeing on the media. We're not seeing the Nigerian students being flung up and dragged up and left behind. Right. Um, that's not the narrative that we're seeing, including and not limited to, you know, that war. But we, we see the narrative around the war in Palestine. Right. And, and the way that there's been a particular kind of silence on that. So I think my my hope would be sort of an effort towards um, real and critical kind of truth telling and, and having narratives and telling stories and marking realities that speak to the breadth and depth of people's lives. Right. That's a kind of um, hope and goal. But in in the absence of that, you know, I think a hope for me would be to have them stop doing too much. Right. Like stop with this, like messing up of this diversity stuff that people are trying to do, um, because I think a lot of that has can also become extremely dangerous. Um, and so I think that there's a part of that that we also have to be cautious um, about and around uh, as we move forward post um, post pandemic TV. For me, let follow up on what it is that. Is that you know, and this is, you know, this moment of wall that some of us are experiencing 
has been something that we have, some of us actually have been experiencing for a very long time. <laughs> you know, it's not just a moment of love. It's something that those of us who are black and brown have been experiencing for a very long time and have immediately experienced even in the context of this world, right? I'm thinking about, as, as it was said, I'm thinking about the black and brown students who are not allowed to escape this moment of love and haven't experienced it in some very, very complicated sort of ways. And so I wonder about what it means to kind of isolate this moment outside of the rest of history. Um, if, yeah, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, and maybe that's a good place to um, stop. Um, just being conscious of the time. I'm wondering if there's any last questions from the class or from the audience. Anyone? I'm sure we're going to have great discussion as, as soon as the Zoom's turned off. <laughs> I just want to say thank you again to Idil, Ricky, and Chris. Um, this was a really illuminating, smart, fun and just like hilarious conversation. And you've certainly give us, given me a lot to ruminate on. Um, so thanks again. Um, and thank you again to uh, our supports for the event today, Zane, um, Mel, Anissa, David, and of course, Marussia. Uh, thank you to our audience today and Marussia's entire class for being here and taking the time. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone has a good night. Thank thanks, you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye.